Dave's neighbor, Ted Anderson. Bought his first bike about 10 years ago. Ted bought it to ride to work. It's a modest bike, a commuter with three speeds and a saddlebag. And because he didn't know any better, that bike made Ted modestly happy. Bike to work when the weather was warm and the roads were dry, and that was more or less that. For more or less the summer, until Ted figured bikes out. Today, 10 years later, Ted owns seven bikes. <laughs> they hang from hooks in a sparkling row in his basement, as if he was running a bike store down there. Closest to the door, his go-to machine, a classic Italian road bike, a Pinarello, with a leather saddle, drop handlebars, and campy components, the bike Ted uses to get around. Beside the Pinarello, it's polar opposite, a three-speed Dutch bike. Ted uses it when it's snowing. Next is the off-road Trek, Ted's only American bike, his homage to Lance Armstrong. And beside that, in the place of honor, his pride and joy, his racing bike, his baby blue artisan-built carbon fiber Torelli. It cost him $12,000. Everything on the Torelli is handmade, right down to the $200 ultralight carbon fiber water bottle. <laughs> it's all about saving weight, shaving grams. It's what you do if you're a serious cyclist, and Ted is serious. Ted made the leap from riding to racing on his 40th birthday. It's nothing for him to come home on a weeknight, jump on his bike, and go for a 50-kilometer ride. Every Sunday, he hauls the bike out to the country on top of his car and hammers out a century. That's a 100-kilometer ride. <laughs> Ted always starts and finishes his rides with an espresso at Kenny Wong's Cafe, Wong's Scottish Meat Pies. <laughs> he doesn't have to go to Kenny's. He has his own espresso machine at home, but since Kenny got his machine, dropping in has become Ted's ritual. He likes it there. Likes to tell Kenny the latest news about his bike. Or if Kenny is busy, anyone else who makes the mistake of looking remotely interested. <laughs> Ted says being on the Torelli is more like dancing than riding. He says he and his bike know each other so well, they react to each other's moods. It's like it has a personality, he was saying to a man who sat down beside him the other day. There are times when the bike is totally in control of me, when I'm not even steering, like I'm just along for the ride. When it comes to biking, Ted has the enthusiasm of a convert. He's not a proponent of cycling. He's a proselytizer. <laughs> he's not an enthusiast, he's an evangelist. <laughs> Think of it as an investment, he preached to Arnie Schellenberger one afternoon, his empty espresso cup on the counter in front of him. You can't be serious, said Arnie. A $12,000 bike? It's an investment in your health, said Ted. Arnie rolled his eyes, and then Ted pounced. Bikes? Don't depreciate the way cars do, said Ted. Arnie had just bought himself a new car. <laughs> Ted has this preacher's zeal for zeroing in on people's weak spots. A bike's the very best way to unwind, he once told Mary Turlington. I always insist my wife Polly go for a ride when she gets as grumpy as you get. <laughs> always calms her down. He believes he's doing people a favor. But when Ted talks about his bike, he manages to make just about everyone in the neighborhood feel bad about themselves. <laughs> everyone, strangely, except for Dave. <laughs> Have you ever felt his bike, said Dave to Kenny one day? Well, you can lift it off the ground with one finger. It's, it's as light as a piece of paper. I can't imagine what it would be like to ride it. Well, that's a lie. Dave spent altogether too much time imagining what it might be like to ride Ted's bike. He's imagined leaning into a corner, 
riding the wind, standing up, swaying from side to side, actually feeling the road beneath him. So one Saturday afternoon, when Dave came upon a yard sale and spotted a set of racing gear for sale, the spandex shorts, (laughs) the colorful jersey, the helmet and the gloves, he bought the lot of it. Even bought himself a pair of cycling shoes. Guy selling the stuff couldn't have been nicer. You have to watch these, he said, flipping one of the black leather shoes over. And he showed Dave the silver cleat on the sole and explained to him how it locked onto the pedal. <laughs> like a ski boot onto a ski, he said. Then he said, be careful walking around. These could be very slippery. When Dave left, he owned everything a cyclist would need, except, of course, a bike. (laughs) But before an expenditure like that, it's good to do a little research, to get a feel for the thing, to push your dreams against the wheel of reality. One day, Dave tried to bring that up with Ted, not, not directly, he sort of hinted around it. Would Ted loan his bike to someone, say for a weekend or something? Ted looked so horrified. (laughs) Dave dropped it right away. But he kept thinking if he could just get even 15 minutes on the bike, he'd be able to tell if he liked it. And then, one afternoon, Dave spotted Ted's car parked in the lane behind his store. He knew it was Ted's car because Ted's bike was on the roof rack. (laughs) Dave ran upstairs and changed into his bike clothes. The whole kit. And he tiptoed carefully out to the alley in his cycling shoes, the way the guy had showed him. He knew he had time for this. Ted was inside having his coffee. Dave wasn't going to ride the bike. He just wanted to sit on it. So he walked out into the alley, and he climbed up onto the roof of Ted's car. He swung himself onto the saddle of Ted's pride and joy. And he leaned over the handlebars, feeling amazingly good. This was something he could do. He could totally do this. He waved his hands over his head, just like the guys in the Tour de France. And that is when Ted walked out the back door of the restaurant. Dave holding his hands over his head, Ted with his head down, staring at a map. And Dave thought, okay, okay, I can get off the bike and slip down the other side of the car before Ted sees me. So he shifted all his weight onto his right foot so he could step off the bike. And there was an ominous click. The pedal grabbed the cleat of his shoe just like the man told him it would. Like a ski grabbing a ski boot. And it wouldn't let go. So Dave pushed with the other foot. There was a second click. Then Dave heard the car door slam. And the engine started. And they began rolling down the alley. This was a Sunday morning. Ted was heading to the country. Dave was perched on his roof. Dave looked like the space shuttle bolted on top of a 747. Ted pulled out of the alley and onto the street right in front of a taxi. The taxi driver pointed at Ted's roof and shouted, This was not unusual. This happens to Ted frequently. People who know bikes often point at his roof. Ted smiled at the cabbie and waved back. Then he stepped on the gas and he pulled into the traffic. More than the usual number of people honked their horns that day. And each time they did, Ted smiled proudly and honked back, (laughs) while Dave clung on for dear life. 
his hair pushed back in the wind, his mouth frozen open. He looked like a kid on a roller coaster, but not one of the happy ones. And then Ted hit the highway and he picked up ahead of speed and the bike's wheels began to spin in the wind. Pretty soon, Dave was pedaling his heart out. He actually looked like one of the guys in the Tour de France, but not one of the happy guys. Unfortunately, Ted's bike rack hadn't been designed for Dave's added weight. It began to work loose. So as they flew along, Dave started to sway from side to side on top of that car. Panic can be a wonderful thing. It helps you get a lot done in a short period of time, often without a lot of extra thought. Dave, who had been twisting his feet this way and that, was finally seized completely by panic and he twisted one of his feet the correct way. His right foot flew urgently free. It was caught by the wind and began flapping behind him like a windsock. The other foot popped out almost immediately. It flapped around too. And for a moment, Dave lost sight of what was happening. He turned and stared in amazement at his legs flapping behind him. He had no idea he was that flexible. And then he did the only thing he could think of doing. He swung his left leg over the frame and he stepped onto the roof, (laughs) clinging onto the bike like a wing walker from the days of the barnstorming biplanes. His colorful jersey was flapping in the wind as he dropped down to his knees and grabbed the straps that held the bike rack to the roof. Then he began to inch his way toward the front windshield. Below him, and oblivious to the drama on his roof, Ted was having the time of his life. He had just slipped his all-time favorite album into the CD player, the best of John Denver. Ted was driving down the road without a care in the world, tapping the steering wheel and singing along with the music, Take Me Home, Country Roads. He was just coming to the chorus, almost heaven, West Virginia, take me home, country roads. When out of nowhere, there was a face on the windshield staring at him. An upside down face obscuring his vision. Ted screamed in terror. Take me home, sang John Denver. No, screamed Ted. And then Ted slammed on the brakes. A number of things happened all at once. The car screeched to an abrupt stop. The paper, light, baby blue Torelli lifted off the roof and floated up in the air like a piece of paper. Seemed to hover there for a moment. It hit the pavement just in front of Ted's front wheels. He barely felt it as he rolled over it. (laughs) At that exact instant, Dave, who had a death grip on the rack's straps, flipped over the windshield and landed on the hood. And Ted finally knew what had happened. It was his worst nightmare. He had killed a cyclist. And the cyclists look oddly familiar. <laughs> this was all several weeks ago now. Time heals many wounds. Dave quietly dropped his cycling clothes in a goodwill box the next week. Ted got himself a new bike with the insurance money. He doesn't talk about the new bike nearly as much as he talked about the old one. If you press him, he will tell you that he he still feels a good bike can be a man's salvation. But that really depends on who he's talking to. (laughs) 
Ted's discovered the problem with proselytizing. When you preach, you never know who your converts will be. <laughs> <laughs>